All right, so let's get started. Good morning, everyone. My name is Catherine. I'm with the MSU Science Festival, and we are here with another Saturday morning session. I'm also, um, excuse me, Saturday morning science session. Um, I'm also joined this morning by Roxanne Troon, our lead festival coordinator, and Dr. Joseph Hill from MSU. Welcome. So thank you so much for joining us this morning. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, so today, I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about my work here at MSU, where basically we're studying plant shape, plant form, how plants grow. Um, so I have, I have some visual aids to kind of help us out a little bit here. Um, so if you look outside, you probably notice, if you've ever looked at different plants, you, you might have seen that they have lots of different shapes. Um, just some examples, here's like some conifers, some pine trees, and they, you can see my screen. Um, yeah, so they they usually have this nice tall shape with outward growing branches getting wider and wider as you get towards the base. And uh, that that's compared to some other trees, deciduous trees, leafy trees that lose their leaves in the winter, um, like this guy here. You know, that's might might be your stereotypical tree that you might draw. You know, just your big poofy looking tree. Um, but then, you know, there's, there's lots of other forms. Like for example, here on the left, we have a tree that's a lot more like a broom. So it kind of goes up a lot and then much more, much more straight and upright. But then we also have some really crazy looking trees sometimes. Um, on the right here, you know, this tree, it likes to go up, but then it decides, you know, I'm going to grow down some. Kind of like a waterfall, like a weeping willow or a weeping tree. Um, so there's lots, there's lots of different plant forms. Um, here's just, you know, another example. This tree, it, it grows up, but it also kind of, you know, goes around to the out, not quite down, not straight up, not all the way out. Um, it has all kinds of different shapes. Uh, and I love this picture because we have, you know, our evergreen tree on the right showing its shape, you know, just kind of Christmas tree E out. And then we have, you know, a tree that doesn't have its leaves yet because it's still spring. And it's just more kind of out and around that puffy shape. So we're trying to understand how do the trees and all the other plants decide to do this? So they, they have to figure out a way to grow like this. And it's more than just plants and trees, people, animals, we all grow in different ways. Um, like, you know, our arms or our hands, for example, they, they have to know when to start growing, when to stop growing, how to take a particular shape and stay in that shape um, to make sure that it can do what it needs to do. Um, so one of the, in, in addition to just being, you know, a really interesting question, I think, um, this can also be important for things we eat. You know, plants are a big part of our diet. It's a lot of things we eat. And one of the things we study here at Michigan State is peach trees. Um, so here's just a palm tree is another example of a, a funky looking tree because they just go straight up and have some fronds. Um, but then here's a peach tree that I wanted to show. So on the left is just a normal peach tree. It's kind of bushy. It goes out kind of that big fluffy shape of, you know, maybe your standard standard tree. But on the right, we have a different kind of peach tree and it's probably pretty obvious that it looks different. It just grows up. Its branches just want to go straight up all the way, all the time. Um, so this is just some of the variation we have in nature, where we can have very similar trees grow in completely different ways. Another example of this, another type of tree, peach tree that we study, is this weeping tree. On the left, we have just a normal peach tree. Um, it grows up a little bit out just your normal type of shape. But on the right, the weeping tree, all the branches just bend downward, kind of like a weeping willow. And what's really interesting is a lot of these changes are driven by genetics or genes. So those are the instructions that tell the organism, the plant, the person, you or me, how to make them, how to you know make the flowers pink versus white, how tall you're gonna be, um, uh, you know, how, how thick are the branches going to be? How sweet is the fruit going to be? Um, and these two trees are actually, they're siblings. So they're like bro brother and sister. 
And there's only one gene difference that's changing the shape between these two trees. There's only one little change that makes you go from the kind of tree on the left where you grow up like this, and then this downward weeping type growth. Um, it's kind of like if you had a bicycle and all you did was change just say the tires, but then all of a sudden your bicycle can like drive straight up a wall. It's a totally different thing. You've only made one little change. It might make you go, what is on that tire? How am I able to do this now? And that's the kind of thing that I'm, I'm really interested in here because we've just made one small change, one gene, and all of a sudden the shape of the tree is just completely different. Now in these, in this particular example, we also have another gene that's changed um, to make the flowers go from white to pink. Um, but you know, th those are two separate things and we're mostly focusing on the shape. So these are peaches and I wanna think a little bit about how you would grow fruits and other things we eat because that's really, you know, related to um, what we care about most, you know, it's, it's trying to relate more to our everyday lives the things we eat. So how, how would you grow fruit on a tree? And this is things like peaches, cherries, pears, even nuts like pecans and walnuts and almonds. Um, they all grow on trees and they have to be harvested. And this is a lot different than some of the other foods we eat, like, you know, for example, corn, oats, wheat, um, soybeans. These kind of plants, every year the farmers go out, plant the seeds, the plant grows up, and then they cut down the entire plant and take, you know, whatever, whatever we eat from it, like the ear of corn or the soybean. Um, and then next year they repeat, but trees are a bit different. It's good and it's bad because you plant the tree and it takes a few years before you can start getting this fruit that we like to eat. Um, but then your tree gets to stay there year after year and you can continue to get fruit from it. Um, so there's different benefits and downsides to each of these things. But what I want you to do right now is try to imagine an orchard, like an apple orchard or an orange or a peach orchard, you know, a field with trees in it. And, and think about, you know, how big are the trees, how far apart are the trees, what does the field really look like that you think these fruits that you eat, you know, maybe every day come from and how they're made. And I don't know about you guys, but I know what I usually think of is a picture kind of like this. It's these are some pictures I pulled from Uncle John's Cider Mill, which is a little bit north of Michigan State campus. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever been there, but on the bottom here, we have these trees in the field. And, you know, they're, they're not too big, but they're not tiny. And they're kind of spread apart in a field, plenty of space. And then, you know, you think maybe, well, how do you get the fruit off these trees? And it turns out most of it needs to actually be hand picked. And the trees are large enough that um, the workers need to actually get on ladders, climb up there, pick each fruit by hand. Um, so basically almost every piece of fruit you've eaten has been picked by a human hand um, from some of these trees. And this takes, this takes a lot of work. And while there's plenty of orchards that do look like this, and in the past, this is traditionally how you would grow fruit. Um, nowadays, farmers are finding that, well, actually we can, we can start to change how we're growing these trees to get better fruit, make it cheaper, tastier, more efficient, easier to harvest. Um, if we just kind of change how we're growing the trees instead of this traditional, you know, large trees spaced apart. So some of the newer orchards are being planted and they look a little bit more like this. So you see the trees are a bit smaller. There's a tree here, there's another tree here another one here. Um, and they're a lot closer together. And sometimes you can see there's a wooden pole here and some wires. So there's a, a trellis system to try to help control where the plants are growing. Because the idea is we can try to control the shape and get these trees in a better form, a better shape to get better fruit and make it easier to harvest and cheaper. Um, so uh, There we go. Um, here's just another example um, of these close together trees on a trellis system. So by controlling the plant shape, we can really affect the success of the orchard, the cheaper, better, uh, easier to harvest fruit. But growing fruit like this, it takes a lot of time and effort and money. 
Um, you have to prune the trees. You have to try to control where the branches grow because you know, this shape doesn't quite look like a lot of those trees I was showing you at the beginning. Um, you know, these are nice straight in a, in, a, in a very even wall, but trees like to grow in all kinds of different weird shapes. So you have to kind of force them into these particular shapes. Um, and you also sometimes have to use some hormone chemicals to help them grow in the right way. But the benefit is that now in these kind of systems, you can have many, 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 many more trees on any one piece of land. You can have over a thousand trees, for example, in an acre. And you can see these trees, they're really small and really, really close together, but they form this really beautiful, nice wall that makes it very easy to harvest. And, and it's really good fruit um, because you know one aspect, for example, is most people really like the nice red apples and having this wall where the sun, the sunlight can hit the apples, it, it really helps get that red color. So let's think about, you know, the traditional way of growing these fruit trees and then these new ways I've been showing you. So here we have some pictures of, I believe it's some peach orchards. Um, you know, every year the tree wants to grow, but the farmers need to go out there and prune back some of the branches in order to get them in the right shape and make sure they're gonna produce good fruit. Um, sometimes to make sure the bugs aren't gonna eat your fruit, damage your plants, even kill your plants. Uh, you need to spray some pesticides. And on the, the far right here, we have, you know, quite a sizable apple tree, more like maybe, I know I, this is what I imagine when I think of an orchard, you know, you want a really big tree that makes lots of fruit for every tree. But you see like people have to get very high up in ladders, even maybe sometimes use a bucket to try to get the fruit off of these very large trees. Now, if you compare that to the, these higher density to where you have more plants in a smaller space. You can see this really beautiful wall. See how clean and even it is? And one huge benefit, one great thing about that is now you can start to use more machines. So instead of having to go in there by hand, which is slow and expensive, you can use a machine to go in and help you pick the fruit or get rid of some of the flowers so that you have bigger fruit. Um, and it also, a really good, great example for the environment is this spray picture I have of the traditional looking orchard. Because the trees are all spread out and wide, you have to use a lot of spray, a lot of chemicals, pesticides out in the environment. But with these walls, you don't actually have to use very much spray because everything's nice and neat and even and close together. So you can really minimize the amount of environmental impact you have. So these are just some of the advantages that you have with these types of um, high density systems. Uh, but, and, and that's one of the focuses of our work for how this can impact our everyday lives, but plant shape actually affects lots of other things too. So it's just, you know, I think it's really cool personally. I, I think it's really cool to go out, especially this time of year when there's not yet leaves on the trees and you can just see all the different crazy shapes and you're wondering, well, how does the tree do that? How do the plants know how to make these different shapes and grow in these different ways and why? Um, but it also impacts photosynthesis. So you guys might know that plants make their own food from sunlight hitting the leaves. So the shape of the plant controls how much sunlight hits the leaves and thus how much food the plant is able to make. So shape is important there. Um, it also affects the strength of the branches. Uh, I, I'm sure you guys have seen wind or snow knock over a whole tree or some branches, and sometimes that'll knock out a power line. So trying to understand the shape of trees and plants can, can tell us something about, oh, you know, this type of shape or this type of tree is, is, it might fall if we get too much snow. So maybe we shouldn't have it near a power line. Um, and then another thing is, if you try to think about the roots of a tree, they look a lot like what we can see, the branches, except they're all underground. And roots are super important because they need to take in nutrients and water. And, you know, Mother Nature likes to copy and paste as much as possible. So a lot of the things that Mother Nature uses to control the shape of branches, the same thing happens with the roots underground. It's just harder to see. So the more we know about the shape of branches above ground, that can tell us about the shape of roots underground and how these roots are able to get water and also, you know, hold the plant into the dirt so it doesn't fall over. So there's lots of reasons why we're trying to understand 
the shape of plants and how they grow. Um, but how? How do plants know how to grow and where to grow? You know, I mentioned genes before, so that can control some of it, just like how a gene can determine or show, make a flower pink instead of white or blue. Um, a gene can say, okay, I want you to have your branches really far up or really down. Um, but it's kind of like, well, a genes also control things like your legs and if your legs work. Um, but that just kind of says that you do have legs and that your legs do work. It doesn't necessarily tell you where you go. That might be more like your mom saying, hey, I need you to go into the kitchen and sweep the floor. Um, the genes aren't telling you to go sweep the floor. That's something outside of your body, your mom telling you to do that. So similarly with the plants, you have things outside of the plant kind of directing it where to grow. You have light uh, you have with roots. You especially have water because they need to grow towards water to, to be able to take in that water. Plants are very thirsty. Um, but another really important thing that you may not have thought of is gravity. And plants can feel gravity just like we can feel gravity. You may not have ever thought about, I can feel gravity, but it's, that's feeling gravity lets you know, you know which way is up and down. Um, it's kind of like your sense of smell or taste, but it's a little bit harder to notice because we're always feeling it, um, whether like not, you know, not like a smell or a sight where, you know, mm, I smell delicious cookies, but you don't always smell cookies, but you're always feeling gravity. So you kind of always know which way is up and down. And the same thing happens in plants. And just to kind of give an example, here's some trees that were growing on this slope, this hill here. Oh, shoot. Um, and sometimes hills shift, the ground moves a little bit. And these trees, that happened to them. And then they started growing sideways like this. Or once the ground shifted, they were to the side. Now, the trees felt that. They felt that they weren't growing straight up anymore. And they had to adjust. So you can see they started to bend how they were growing so they could go back to being straight up. So they felt the gravity. They felt, oh, I'm not. I'm not straight up anymore. I need to change how I grow and fix myself to be straight up. Kind of like this guy in the background who was just always straight up because he never got shifted. Um, and in the lab, so some experiments we do, we usually use these small little model plants and we can just take a plant and turn it all the way on its side. So really extreme. And you can see that really quickly, the plant starts to fix itself and grow upward within just an hour or two. I know most of us probably think of plants as not being able to move, but um, they actually move, move quite a bit. So you can see that if you ever change the orientation of a plant, the direction, it's gonna wanna fix itself because it's feeling the gravity and it's wanting to um, adjust its growth back because gravity is telling it where it needs to grow um, in addition to all these other things. So I wanna take a moment hop out of these pictures. So how do you think a plant might do this? Um, so our body, first of all, is made of cells. Every living thing is made of cells. And in plants, usually these cells are kind of long rectangles. So as an example, I just have this glass jar filled with water. And we could pretend this is a plant cell. And there are certain plant cells that have these heavy little balls inside. Um, and they're very special cells, just like we have different cells in our body. We have heart cells, we have eye cells, and they do different things. You know, um, Blood cells help carry oxygen around our body. Our eye cells help us see. So these few special cells inside the plant help it feel gravity. And we have similar cells inside, I think, our ears um, to help us feel gravity. But inside these cells, there's these heavy little balls that I'm representing as marbles here. And what happens is if the plant ever gets turned or tilted, those balls fall. And as they fall on the sides of the cell, there's lots of sensors. So the plant can actually feel or sense that those balls have changed position. They're now along the bottom. So that means, oh, look, I'm on my side. I need to start growing and fix myself to get the balls back on the bottom again. So I can actually show you uh, 
how that works in the actual plant. Um, we call these little balls, they're made of starch, amyloplast, amyloplast. You can see this is a, a picture of a plant root zoomed in really far. And we have one cell here. Yeah. One cell here that we're zooming in on. And you can see these little tiny balls are falling in the bottom of the cell there. And you can actually see them move. So here we have another, another picture of a plant root. Um, and the balls have been stained. So now they're really dark. And what's going to happen is this root's going to be turned to the side, and you're going to actually see those little black balls start to slide and move. So it's going to happen kind of quick, though. So ready? Turns to the side, and you can start to see them sliding and falling down. And when that starts to happen, the plant feels this, and it senses, oh, look, gravity has changed. Um, and that's basically how plants feel gravity. And from there, they need to respond to gravity and change how they grow. But what do you think would happen if a plant couldn't feel or respond to gravity? That would be an interesting thing. It'd kind of be the same as being in space, where there is no or, or little gravity. Um, and this is the kind of question we ask a lot of time in science. When we're trying to understand how something works, we first go, well, what happens if we get rid of a piece of it or break a part of it. It's kind of like, I want to know how a car works. So you go into the engine and just one at a time, you take out one piece of the engine and you go, how good does the car still work? Does it turn on? Does it drive fast? Does it use as much gasoline? You know, what does each piece do? So we usually do that by, by breaking a gene and seeing what happens. And you know, sometimes we do it on purpose, but sometimes you just go out in Mother Nature and you find a weird plant or a weird animal that's different. And you, you try to figure out, well, what's different about it? What's making it different? And here's a, here's a great example. Every once in a while, a farmer will come across a corn plant that's just laying on the ground, just completely fallen over, not because of wind or anything. That's just how it naturally grows. If you keep the seeds from this corn plant and plant them, all of those seeds will grow like this. And they called these corn plants lazy because they're just flopping around on the ground lazily. Um, they look kind of ridiculous in a way. And it turns out that these plants, they have a gene that's broken somewhere in that gravity sensing, gravity response pathway. Because you start out feeling the gravity, but then you have to respond. It's not enough just to feel. It's kind of like if you're given instructions like to sweep the kitchen. The first part is hearing the instructions, but then you gotta actually go do it. You gotta think about it. You gotta get up, you gotta walk over there. You gotta actually sweep the kitchen. So they can still feel the gravity. They still have these little balls, they still fall, but then there's some problem in one of the next steps. And we're trying to understand that process. We wanna understand you know, the whole process going from feeling gravity to then growing in the right direction. And corn are pretty big. They're a little bit hard to work on. So in lab, we use this little plant called Arabidopsis. And on the left, you have a normal Arabidopsis plant. It grows, you know, like most plants, just up to the side and out, like kind of like a tree. And on the right, we have a lazy one. So it's the same kind of gene that we saw in those corn plants. And you can see its branches just flop around and grow down. Even this top branch here, it's, this picture is a bit cheating because we're kind of holding up the top. Um, if we weren't holding it up, it'd just be flopped over to the side, but then it'd be really, really hard to even take a picture of. Um, that's how floppy and knocked over it is. So a lot of the things we do in lab and trying to understand this process are taking um, plants like this, so mutants, where we've broken a gene, and then we mix and match. We do trial and error um, to try to figure out what's going on. It's kind of like if we go back to my car example, um, you know, let's say tires. You, you may know there's lots of different kinds of tires. There's like NASCAR has very special tires that don't have any treads. They're very slick, so they stick to the track. 
but then there's you know tires for going through the mud or the snow and then tires for the road and it would be like switching out different tires and then seeing how fast can the car go how much gasoline does the car use so we can first of all study these lazy plants and know what's different now what can they do what can't they do now that we've gotten rid of this gene obviously they can't grow upwards anymore um, but then we can go backwards we can go okay well what what parts of this gene are important what if we change a little bit of it can we try to get it back to the normal plant um, so it's a lot of trial and error and just slowly trying to understand what's going on inside the cell and inside the plant um, to figure out you know how this is working uh, and by learning more about this it can help us then start to engineer or breed plants to have different shapes because you can see this has a really really big effect on plant shape and another gene that is very similar is this one i showed here um, it's kind of related to lazy where instead of growing out and down and not feeling gravity it just wants to grow up just up completely opposite um, so we're trying to understand how these things work because you know maybe we don't want a plant that grows oh dang maybe we don't want a tree that grows completely up maybe we want a tree that grows a little bit up you know maybe out to the side a little bit or maybe straight out instead of out and down like lazy because we're trying to find ways that we can change how these plants grow to make it easier for the growers to then grow food rather than having to spend so much time and so much money and effort to prune the trees every year to tie them to a, a trellis to a metal wire to keep them in that, that really beautiful uh nice shape we have here instead of having to put in lots of work well can we just make it to where the plants want to grow kind of in that way um, that's kind of part of the goal of, of, of what we're getting at in addition to just trying to understand how it works and another interesting thing is that since this since these plants a lot of this shape stuff has to do with gravity well um, nasa would really like to grow plants in space because you know it would be very interesting to have human missions to mars or to the moon um, but you can only pack so much food and it's it's better to be able to eat fresh food um, so being able to grow a plant in space would be a really nice thing and it turns out that these lazy plants that's what it looks like when you grow a plant in space they just flop down because these plants can't respond to gravity just like if you grow a plant in space there is no gravity for it to feel to begin with so we can use them to try to study gravity and if we can find a way to reverse this process oops if we can find a way to reverse this process to to change the genes to where you know now um now you don't need to be able to feel gravity maybe instead you can feel light to grow upward um, because shape is really it's the combination of a lot of different things it's it's kind of like if you're driving in a car and you have a bunch of passengers, say your mom and your dad and a few of your friends, and they're all shouting different directions at you. And you have to pick a direction to, to try to figure out where to go. Um, and that's kind of what, how, how you figure out where to grow as a plant. Um, you have all these different signals. You have light, water, temperature, wind, gravity. They're all telling you to grow in different directions and fighting. And sometimes some of those will be stronger. Like maybe if your mom yelled really loud, you're like, okay, I'm going to turn left because mom's yelling. I really need to turn left. Um, but other times maybe you use consensus. If, if more people are saying we need to go right, you know, maybe you'll go right that way. It's, it's the same way where gravity is a really strong signal. You need to grow up. You need to grow up. You need to get out of the dirt, grow up towards where the sun is. But then once you start getting a lot of light, that starts to fight with the gravity uh, signal and you change a little bit how you're growing. Um, so we're, we're thinking that a lot of these processes are kind of involved, like kind of like the highway system all intersects with each other. Um, all these different things intersect and you can take different 
different paths to get to the same kind of shape. So we're just trying to understand all the different steps in these paths and, and how we can change the shape of plants, basically. Um, and a lot of that has to do with gravity and sensing gravity and responding to gravity. Um, so that's, I guess, most of what I have to present. I don't know if there's any questions. Uh, yes, Dr. Hill, we do have uh, one question came up uh, from Yu Feng. He wants sure. to know, the Aridopsis doesn't look as lazy as the lazy corn. Any idea why? Ah, so yeah, like I mentioned, um, it's a little bit cheating in that picture because I was um, holding the plant up uh, rather than rather than just letting it fall over like the corn is out in the field. I was purposefully holding it up for the picture. Um, so it is actually quite as lazy if you just let it flop and fall over. Um, but it's also a slightly different plant. Um, different plants listen to different signals more or less. Um, so like I was saying, there's light and other signals um, that go into it. And uh, just depending on what signals each plant listens to, it can change their ultimate shape. Um, but yeah, that's and that's one of the reasons we're looking into different kinds of fruit trees. We can use the Arabidopsis some, but we also need to, like I do some work in apple um, because we need to see, well, how, how do these things affect apple in particular? Uh, is, there, is there something different about apple that makes us able to uh, change the shape more or less? Because we're trying to, you know, fine tune, trying to figure out how to fine tune these shapes and get them just how we want them. Um, we did have another question, kind of in the same realm. Sarah wants to know, do all plants use those little beads to determine gravity or do some have different mechanisms? So for the most part, yeah. And like I said, even humans have them. They're kind of made out of different things um, and, and other animals, but there's, there's usually some type of, of little ball inside a specialized cell that just falls, just uses gravity to fall. And that tells the organism, whether it be an animal or a plant, uh, which way is up. Um, so generally, yeah. All right. And James um, said, you mentioned that sometimes growers need to use chemicals to reshape the plants. Is it possible to do this with only chemicals certified for organic growers? And also, does changing the branch shape chemically uh, change the root shape? Okay, so I don't know the entire list of the organic chemicals, so I'm not sure which ones are or aren't qualified. Um, I would assume that there probably are some. Um, in fact, I'm almost certain there's at least a few. And different chemicals can do different things. Most of them are, they're actually technically natural. Just in doing research in plants and trying to understand how they grow, this is one of the kinds of things that comes out of it. We've learned, oh look, the plants make this one hormone, this one chemical. And when they do that, you know, then you grow up or then you get a new branch or then you flower sooner. And then we can go, oh, well, I can, I can make some of that myself and put it on the plants um, to, to make them do it when I want them to do it. So uh, it usually shouldn't change the roots because a lot of the times when you're adding the chemicals to the outside, it's only affecting where the chemical goes. You know, one good example is if, here we go, I can draw this. Um, am I sharing? Am I sharing? Yes, oh, share. There we go. Um, so if we have a tree and it's got some branches and then we have some type of trellis system right? So like some wires. And what you would want is to potentially tie down the branches so they now follow this wire, right? But down here on the bottom, you don't have a branch to follow that wire. So what you can, what some chemicals allow you to do is you just add a little bit in that area and that will cause a new branch to come out. So then you can get one that grows along this wire. 
So that's just one example of the, the type of hormone you can do. And you, as you can see there, it's a very local effect. Um, so it shouldn't change the roots. So, and here's another question from Sarah. Do only certain cells have the little sedimentable, the balls that fall down to help you sense gravity? And is it all of them? And it's, it's not all of them. It's actually, there's only very few of them. So things are specialized, which means they only have a specific job. I'll, I'll go back to us. Um, you know, not every cell on our skin grows hair, like my beard or like the top of my head. And, you know, only your blood cells carry oxygen around your blood. And then your liver cells and your stomach cells, they help digest food and detoxify things that go in your body. So different cells have different jobs. And inside the plant, there's just a few cells that do this gravity sensing. And then they have to send out signals to tell the rest of the plant um, how to change where they're growing. And then one of the things about plants is they can't get up like we can. They can't, they can move, but not quite like we can move. Um, usually they move by growing more. So the, the part of the plant that's already there stays uh, while the part of the plant that's already there stays. Well, the new growth can then, you know, if you grow, if you turn the plant outside, what you're gonna get is some of this existing plant will bend, but then the new growth is the main thing that's gonna be changing direction. Um, so a lot of those special cells are in the newest part of the plant. So the very top of the, the shoot tip and all the branches, the very ends, and then the very tips of the roots. Um, but the older parts, like the, the big part of the trunk down at the base of the tree, um, those don't really have them anymore because at that point, they can't really use them. Plants are kind of like brick houses. They're, they're not like Play-Doh that can move in shape. They, as they get older, they get stronger and harder. That's why wood is so strong and hard. So they're not able to really move and bend so much. Um, they kind of get stuck. Um, so you don't really need those cells down there because you can't move anyway. And then let's see. Um, Caitlin, Libby. who's 10, wants mm -hmm. to know how come lazy plant branches don't float up in space if there's no gravity? Yeah, I mean, if there is no gravity, they're probably just going to be, instead of falling down a little bit, they're going to be more straight out and just floating around. Um, but yeah, it looks about the same where they just, instead of the normal plant shape we have where you grow up in a specific straight shape, um, you go out or down and it's just kind of, you know, loose and floats around and, and easy like that. Um, I can, so Ryan has a question. Uh, do all lazy plants result from a gene causing the plant to be unreactive to the location of the beads? Are there any gene mutations that cause the beads not to form? So these are really great questions. Um, lazy specifically, yes, because that one gene is somewhere in between the, the balls falling and then the plant responding. So anytime you have a mutation in the lazy gene, you're getting uh, a disconnect in that process, but there's other genes in that process that we haven't figured out yet, or at least we think there's other genes. Um, that's one of the things we're trying to, trying to understand. But there's lots of different ways that this system can break, just like there's lots of ways your body or a car or a bicycle or anything else can break. Um, so, you know, like you mentioned, there are gene mutations that can cause those balls not to form. They're made of starch. So, you know, like you may have used cornstarch in cooking or ironing shirts. Um, so it's just this big sugar. And any kind of the gene, any of the genes that are involved in making starch definitely eliminate those balls being able to be made and you get the same kind of looking plant. So um, this may be kind of what you were trying to ask, but if you see a plant that's not able to sense gravity and growing down like that, it doesn't mean it's lazy because there's lots of different genes involved. It could be one of these other genes. Uh, you have to go in and figure that out um, because there's, there's a lot of ways to skin a cat basically. Um, so Barbara asks, could a lazy plant accidentally grow its roots up and it stalk down when they sprout? Or can the seeds sense the light? And see, this is, I really like this question because 
Uh, that's exactly, you know, I mentioned that a lot of the same rules that apply to branches apply to roots. And one way that plants control these two different things is they have duplicated their genes. So they have one lazy gene that does the roots or that does the roots and then a second lazy gene that does the shoots. So what happens is if you just mess up the lazy gene for the branches, you just get the branches growing down. And then if you go and mess up the gene in the roots, you do actually, you can get roots growing up. There are some mutants where the roots start to pop out of the ground. And then when you, when you mess up both of them, it's, it's real bad because uh, the roots are growing up and the branches are growing down and it, it, it has a lot of trouble growing um, because it's just going all over the place. Uh, and it is true that it does affect the ability for the seeds to get out of, get out of the dirt. Um, you know, I didn't mention this in my talk, but that's another really important reason that plants need to feel gravity. You know, in, in nature, when a seed falls off a tree, no one's there to go, oh, yeah, okay, you need to be like this in the ground so that you can grow up. They just fall randomly. And once they start to grow, they have to feel gravity so they know which way is up and, and grow in that direction. But some of these lazy mutants, yeah, they they don't know. So they just grow in every direction. And then what you have is a lot of the seeds end up not being able to make a plant because they're not growing in the right direction. They're just growing down or around and they just go through the dirt until eventually they run out of energy because they only have so much. It's like a battery. You, a seed basically kind of has a battery. It has a certain amount of energy it can use to get itself out of the ground to then feel the sunlight and start making its own food and making its own energy. Uh, and then Sarah asks, your idea of changing the gene to grow directionally with light versus grow with gravity is interesting. Is that something that would be done with CRISPR tech? Possibly. So one of, CRISPR is a genetic engineering technology for those of, that, that, that don't know. So what Sarah is asking is, you know, can we go in and figure out a gene to change this on purpose? And yeah, but we have to know what to change. And that's kind of what we do a lot of the time as researchers. Um, we got to figure these things out because there, we know, we know, we know some things about life, but then there's a whole lot of things about life and biology. We just don't know yet. Um, so this is actually one thing I'm doing right now. If we take this, our normal or not normal, but our lazy Arabidopsis, you can see its branches are growing downward like this. So because I don't know what to change to fix it, uh, we're just gonna use random chance. So one way to do that is because we don't know what other gene we can change. Well, let's just randomly make changes and see if we can fix it that way. And this right here is one of those plants. Um, so this is actually, it's lazy, but we can get a good picture. You can see its branches are now growing up. So somehow I've changed something to reverse this lazy growing downwardness. And the next step is to go, what did I change? Um, so I have to figure that out. And what we're hoping is that's going to tell us some of these other steps in these pathways to just better understand how it's sensing gravity. Or maybe it is something else like, you know, we've really enhanced light sensing. So now rather than needing to sense gravity, it's just, it's seeing the light and going, oh, I'm going to grow up to this. Um, but once we know it, then yeah, we could potentially use CRISPR, um, for example, to then apply that to some other crop potentially. Uh, and then Ryan asks, if a tree is leaning one way, can it use gravity to determine how to grow roots to support itself better? Yes and no. I mean, it will try. Um, when it starts to grow on the side, like if it's growing on its side, usually that means, you know, something shifted potentially, maybe um, the dirt gave, gave way like a landslide or a lot of wind or something. So first off, the trunk is going to sense that and it's going to try to correct itself a little bit. Now the roots have their own way to sense gravity and they're probably not going to get changed as much. And they're also mostly 
gonna change at just the tips at the very end of the roots. So not right up next to the ground where you have the big mass of roots connecting to the trunk, but all the little tips everywhere else, they're gonna start to change how they grow to grow more straight down because they're mainly trying to get water. Um, so to some extent, they may compensate to try to you know, strengthen themselves into the ground, but they won't necessarily do it because you know, they can't really think. Um, they just are kind of controlled by what genes they have. And that's, you know, that's basically what, what evolution is. So some of the trees are going to maybe respond and strengthen themselves, and some of the trees aren't. So then if you have this happening all the time, those trees that aren't responding are going to be more likely to die, and then the ones that do stick around. Um, And then we had one other question from sure. Ann. She wanted to know for home gardeners, what plants do you recommend utilizing a trellis for growing to encourage a better yield? Do you have any ideas? Um, so I can't pull specific examples, but lots of different plants can help. And yield's a tricky question sometimes because, you know, it, it depends on exactly what you want. Um, you might get less yield per tree but if you can plant more trees. Um, and then there's other benefits that actual growers have, like I mentioned, spraying and mechanization. So, you know, you may get less yield, but on an actual farm, there's these other advantages, like I could plant more trees in a certain area of land, or I don't need to have as many workers um, because I can use machines and, you know, I can harvest quicker and maybe, uh, without damaging the fruit as much with some specialized machines, if I can get these shapes all, all in, in line. So for the home grower, it might not be quite as useful because you don't have all these other aspects. You're just going to be doing things, you know, by hand at a very low, a low scale, but it is beautiful. Um, so that's, that's the other thing about trellising and home growing is that um, there's the aesthetic. So you know, I showed one of our weeping peaches, and there's lots of different weeping varieties. Some of them are actually lazy mutants. Some of them are totally other mutants. Sometimes they involve gravity. Sometimes they don't. Um, there's lots of different ways to break a plant so that it grows downward. Um, but a lot of people think that that downward growing weeping shape is, is very beautiful. Um, so it's a common home grower thing. Um, yeah. I did have a question myself. So sure, you, see, you see um, in sunflowers, they turn their heads to the sunlight to grow best. Yes. Is that also a gene related? And is it related to the, do they have little cells that help them as well? Yeah, so most of that is gonna be sensing the light. Um, so, you know, like I mentioned, you have all these competing signals from the environment telling the plant where to grow and yeah, uh, I've seen time lapses before of a sunflower plant turning its head over the day. Our house plants can do this too, where they turn their leaves over the day. And they're using some of the, some of the same processes to do the moving as when you're responding to gravity. Um, it's just a different signal, a different set of instructions telling them to do that. Um, so what's happening there is it's, so gravity is usually saying, grow up, grow up, grow up, grow up, up, up. Uh, and that's real important when you're in the dark, like underground or in the shade, because up is where the sun is. So if you go up, in theory, eventually you're going to get to the light. But once you start to get to that light, the, there's totally different signals that go like, let's not grow so much up. Let's start going out. Because we want to, we want to get all of the sunlight, kind of like a satellite dish. You know, you want to get wider and out and take it all in. So those start to compete with each other, but they're both still there. They're just always fighting. And then with like the sunflower example, what you're going to have is sun on this side, but on the back side, it'll be shaded. So on the back side, you no longer have that light signal telling you to stop. So then you have more of that gravity signal telling you to grow. Um, so you start to get growth on the shade side and that pushes you 
towards the light by getting that growth. Uh, so you're using a lot of the same processes and it's just, it's a constant fight. It's, it's like a, a room full of voices all shouting different instructions at the same time. And, and the plant kind of has to try to make sense of it. And sometimes some voices are louder and sometimes they're quieter. And you know, which voices there are and how loud they are can change depending on the plant. So that's why some plants grow in some ways and some plants grow in other ways. Um, yeah. Wonderful. Thanks so much for joining us again. Um, yeah, no problem. I hope you guys enjoyed that and learned a little bit about, you know, how plants grow um, and feel things. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, well, if anyone has any other questions, um, Dr. Hill, would you mind sticking around in the comments section on Facebook to answer a couple questions? I think there are a couple we didn't get to that sort of got lost in the middle there. Yeah, uh, sure thing. No problem. Great. So everyone, feel free to keep asking your questions in the comment section. We're going to take a short break and start back at noon um, with Dr. Zach Constan. Yeah, thank you everyone for having me. I hope you yeah. enjoyed.